In your programs tonight, you'll see a really wonderful drawing by a 12-year-old public school artist named Sasha Matthews, who's done uh, superhero drawings for all of the honorees as a gift. And Sasha was uh, very upset by the last election, as uh, I'm sure many people in this room were. And she decided she was going to use her talent to raise money for the ACLU. And she's raised over $5,000. <laughs> And Sasha's 12 years old, and she's going to introduce an honoree tonight who was on the Kinder Transport and came to America when she was 12 years old. So I'm going to bring Sasha to the stage now to introduce... Um, Ingrid... Fr Sasha's going to introduce Ingrid Frey. Thank you. I recently had the privilege of visiting Ingrid Frank and her husband, George Richardson, at their apartment, a few blocks from where I live on the Upper West Side. Ingrid told me that when she was 12, which is how old I am now, she moved to New York City, having escaped Nazi Germany on the Kinder Transport. She told me that by the time she was 14, she had already joined her first picket line to protest in support of the Scottsboro Boys. 20 protest-filled years later, she camped out in Washington, D.C in support of the Poor People's Campaign, which was organized by Martin Luther King before his assassination. She told me that she was arrested and spent 10 days in jail. But most importantly, she told me that it wasn't getting arrested that mattered. What mattered was achieving change. I was chosen to present this award because I'm doing a fundraiser for the ACLU called Everyday Superheroes to show people the power within themselves to change the world. And I think that Ingrid Frank represents that power. I'm very honored to be introducing Ingrid Frank. The first year that I came, that I was in America, I was 12 years old, and I think, anyway, I know I was in fifth grade, and we had a speaker at an assembly that made such an impression on me that it lasted a lifetime, and I'd like to share it with you. She said, I have forgotten the rest of her speech, but this I will never forget. She said, live your life Oh, bro, wow. <laughs> oh, I was hoping this would not happen. <laughs> I have Parkinson's, and one of the things that happens with it, a thousand others, but one of the things that happens is you forget names and you forget things you're talking about. And five minutes later, or ten minutes later, when you don't need it anymore, it comes back. But I'm going to try and have it come back now. <laughs> anyway, the, the speaker said, oh, I forgot about this. The speaker said, live your life in such a way so that when you are old, when you're getting ready to die, you don't stand before your fate and say, is that all there is? <laughs> so live your life with decision to do something useful for the world. I chose human rights, civil rights. And that's because, as the young lady told you, I was born in Germany, and I experienced the Nazis. I was there in Kristallnacht when they came into our house and broke everything and dragged my father off to Dachau. But I had an experience at that time even though there was no legal Jim Crow in New York. It was being practiced anyway. Nobody lived on the same block as any yeah. Negroes or colored people. 
as we were the right color, and I guess they were the wrong color. That's why we called them colored people. But I managed to get to talk to some girls in a swim, black girls in a swimming pool. And they asked me, how come I had such a funny accent? And I replied that that was a German accent and they wanted to know a little bit more about Germany. So I told them why I had to be sent out of Germany on a Kindertransport. Oh, brother. Oh, and I told them some of the things that had happened to me and my family in Germany. And one of the girls said, oh, that sounds exactly what they have, what happens to us in New York and down south. My grandfather was beaten and he was killed. And then they hung him up and put him on fire. And it was suddenly as though a, a, a sheet had dropped from my eyes. I had noticed that there were no black people, no black sales ladies, no black bus drivers, no black anything. But it was as though a sheet had suddenly uh, uh, had dropped from my eyes and I recognized that America treated its black people the way Ge Germany at that time, there were no extermination camps yet, but the way Germany was treating its, its Jews, making them feel inadequate, less than, and I know how horrible that could be. So I decided that I was going to never let that happen again. And I would do everything in my power to see that people of all colors could live together, that people of all nationalities and languages and races had enough food, and to do my best to make the world a better place. I Let me just round it up quickly. I was afraid this was going to happen. Blame it on Parkinson's. <laughs> That's the, the, everything is the fault of Parkinson's. I marched on my first picket line when I was 14 to free the Scottsboro boys. Fell in love with Paul Robeson when I was 14. Because, not only because he was a great actor and a great singer, but because he was so courageous. He gave up a career that he had struggled 40 years for when the, they wouldn't let him out of the country, they wouldn't let him into the country, they claimed he was a communist. And he never named names and he never gave in. And I admired that and he became my role model. And I became the chairman of our Ban the Bomb Committee, our Fair Housing Committee, various other committees in the suburban town. Belleville, New Jersey, that I lived in. And after a couple of years, I met George Richardson, who was a civil rights leader, here he is. And a man with more courage and more empathy and with more optimism and creative ability. And we worked together on running a black mayor for Newark, which was the, would have been the first example of a black, that a black man can run for mayor. We didn't expect to win. And he organized a picket line in front of a construction site for a high school in Newark, where we found, he found out that there were no black workers on the entire force. It was Lily White. And I'm quite getting much too long. I want to say we have a book that we just finished called Changing America. And it's the story of our being together 50 years ago when it was not right for a black man and a white woman to work together or to be together. And we worked together for 52 years. And we're still working together. And I think I've talked long enough. <laughs> this is my son. Don't
say my son the dog. And my daughter. <laughs> <laughs>